Thank you very much. Um, what well, made an impression on you, and it makes an impression on me to hear it repeated. <laughs> uh, any case, um, it's good to be here. I've been here a number of times, and I have a lot of respect for this school. It's very, it's customary, of course, when you're introduced to say you're happy to be here. Um, the truth of the matter is that I kind of thought I would be home watching the opening game of the Nationals on TV, <laughs> <laughs> which is started at 4 o'clock. Um, so I think I'm going to have to designate somebody in the back there. Uh, every time the Nationals make a run, the, the raise his hand, and, and every time Bryce uh, Harper hits a home run, they put up two hands. <laughs> but uh, he's right about Isidore, and today um, is the day of Isidore, but because of Easter, well, you don't have any other saints days during the Easter octave. Um, Isidore got kind of bumped. But um, he, was, he was a bishop in early medieval Spain. And he wrote books on spelling and on grammar. And you know, it sounded like, well, why is a bishop doing that? But you know, it was at a transitional period. And it was because without grammar, without the proper use of language and without literature, you can't really communicate anything. And so it became the foundation. And that, that precisely is what this school is about and why I have such respect for it. I mean, you all know what the people major in when they go to college today. Finance, business, engineering, technology, all those things that seem to lead to a job. But, but Christendom has another, another vision, another mission. And I'm very happy to be able to come here and applaud what, what you are trying to do. So I was asked to speak about faith and reason, and with particular attention really to classical and early Christian culture because of your program here. And most of the issues about faith and reason appear in the early church, the doctrine of God. Every time we pray the creed on or recite the creed, today we say, consubstantial with the Father. There's a Greek word that has no place in the, in the New Testament, which then became part of Christian tradition. Or when we talk about the two persons and the two, the two natures and the one person of Christ. So virtue in a sort of classical sense really means excellence. And of course, excellence can come in many different forms. You play the flute well, you know, or the violin well, or you particularly uh, skilled at uh, high jumping or something. And, and the natural inclination as human beings is when we see somebody do something virtuously that is in an excellent way, we want to be like them. We want to be able to do that. And so virtue then becomes an essential element in terms of how to form moral or ethical lives. So to give order and coherence then to the general category of virtue, which the Greeks had great respect for, they divided them up into four categories, what we call the cardinal virtues. Now, the English word cardinal comes from the Latin word hinged. And so they knew that there were many, many different virtues, but Plato thought that they all hinge on four virtues. <clears throat> and so they were given their classical formulation in the Republic, and maybe some of you have read them. So the first is wisdom. Wisdom means sound judgment, the ability to see things clearly and to discriminate wisely. And that's something that we all admire. And we know people who have that gift, and not all of us do. The second one is courage. Now, for Plato, courage was a, a martial virtue. He was, beginning, he was thinking primarily about military strength and then those people who keep the city safe. And, um, but he also then recognized that it had to do with a, th that role that some people play of preserving and holding on to that which we cherish and which we, we, we love. So courage is not just a martial, a military virtue. Um, though it comes from the term for manliness, andria in, in Greek, it's an intellectual virtue because it means that you have the inner strength to be able to stand up and to resist when people make fun of you, say you're being foolish, or you, 
you're holding on to something that they think you should not be holding on to. And to stand up against resistance, obstacle, and ridicule. So courage, you say. Then temperance. Temperance is the discipline that is necessary to curb one's appetites. And without that, you can't really live a virtuous life. It, it really means to hold your outer life, the things you do, the people say, the things you say, in harmony with what is within. And the fourth is justice, which is essential when people live together. Because justice means giving to each person their due. I mean, it's, as kids, every one of us says, something. that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. Your mother or your father is making you do something. Or that your brother or sister is doing something that uh, is different from yours. And so it, it, it's something that's essential if people are going to live together, be able to respect and to give to each of you. Now, the cardinal virtues cover a lot of ground. And they offer an attractive pattern of skills and dispositions to attain excellence as a human being, which is really what the Greek word arete means. And in the middle of this last century, Joseph Pieper, a great Catholic philosopher, wrote a book called The Cardinal Virtues. And he said, this intellectual framework was one of the great discoveries in the history of man's self-understanding. And it's continued to be part and parcel of the European mind. So let's take then the cardinal virtues as representative of the voice of philosophical reason. Topic supposed to be reason and faith. The cardinal virtues then, they are the voice of reason. The question might be asked, what do they have to do with Christianity? Or what does virtue have to do with faith? And when you start asking the question that way, you begin to discover some very interesting things. The term virtue occurs only three times in the New Testament. Once in Philippians 4, where Paul writes, it's a beautiful statement. It could be put up in your library or some other place because it really talks about what Christian humanism is all about. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, and the term there is virtue in Greek. But in that context, most translators will translate it as, as excellence, which is really the meaning. If there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. So that's the one place, Philippians 4, the passage worth putting to memory. And it occurs twice in 2 Peter. If you have a course in the New Testament, you may get to 2 Peter at the end of the last lecture. <laughs> it is about as minor an epistle in the New Testament. And no one thinks it was written by Peter. That's another issue. So it's a very minor epistle. But twice in the first chapter, it mentions and it says, supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. So that's it as far as the New Testament has to say about virtue. Now, given the prominence of, of virtue in Greek and Latin writers, its absence is puzzling. Now, I don't mean to say that virtue is an alien concept, but it's clearly not a native Christian word. It's a Greek philosophical term. It belongs to another intellectual and moral discourse. And the reason is obvious. The Bible has other ways of talking about the moral life, about ethics, about how one should live. I'll give you five examples. The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Honor thy father and mother. Second, the seven gifts of the Spirit in Isaiah 111, which are mentioned in the great hymn we'll be singing when we come to Pentecost, Vene Creatus Spiritus. Come, Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. O finger of the hand divine, the sevenfold gifts of grace are thine. And those are enumerated in Isaiah 11. Here they are. 
spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, knowledge and piety, and the fear of the Lord. Though those of you who are scrupulous about biblical matters, they are only in the Septuagint. They're not in the Hebrew. So if you go to your English Bible, unless you go back to the Vulgate or the old Douay version, you're only going to find six. And every year in Advent, when this text is used in, during the Advent season, I get very angry because the new breviary only has six because they're basing it on the Hebrew rather than on the Greek Septuagint, which was the basis for the, for the Vulgate. So, the seven gifts of the Spirit. Third, the oracles of the prophets on justice. Let justice roll down like waters. Amos. Seek justice, correct oppression, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Fourth, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Or, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I say to you, do not resist one who is evil, but if one strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. And if anyone takes your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And then finally, Galatians 5, the fruits of the Spirit in St. Paul. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So the point I'm making is that the Bible has a completely different vocabulary. There's some overlap, but basically it has a different way of speaking about how one should live as, as a Christian. So they don't really need the cardinal virtues. Nevertheless, early on, as early as the year 200, Christian thinkers were drawn to the cardinal virtues and used them to construct systems of Christian ethics. The first is a man by the name of Clement of Alexandria. He was around 200 in Alexandria. Absolutely fascinating person. He is thoroughly, thoroughly Greek. In fact, if you are a scholar of ancient Greek philosophy, a lot of the sayings from the pre-Socratics we only know about because Clement of Alexandria quotes them. And what makes him so interesting to read is here you have a person who's been formed by the Greek tradition, and he's a Christian. And so you can just see how the two are sort of coming together, and he's sort of weeding out here and weeding out there. In any case, he's a fascinating person to read. But he is the first to do so. And why do they turn then to the um, cardinal virtues? Well. One reason one might say, and I think it's a, it's a superficial answer, is that Christianity, as it began to make its way in the Roman world, Christian thinkers were trying to find the means to express what they believed in terms of the Greek and Roman world. Put it another way, to pour the teaching and the language of the scripture into a familiar vessel. But it's not really that simple because the cardinal virtues actually do appear in the Bible. Anybody know where? In the Book of Wisdom, which is among the apocryphal books. So it's not exactly a prominent place, but they do appear in, in Wisdom, the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter eight. Now, the Wisdom of Solomon is a book that the literary device that it uses is Solomon is now teaching wisdom and talking about what he as a king needs. And so Solomon speaks, he didn't write any of this. It was written probably in the second century or the first century before the rise of Christianity. Solomon said he could not rule his kingdom based on his own knowledge. He said, even if one is perfect among men, without the knowledge that comes from God, he will be regarded as nothing. For the reasoning of mortals is worthless, and our designs are likely to fail. We must turn, he says, to the wisdom that comes from God. If anyone loves righteousness, says Solomon, the fruits of her labor are temperance, prudence, not wisdom, justice, and courage. Nothing in life is more profitable for men than these. 
So the cardinal virtues are in the Bible. The one difference is, is that the term for wisdom, Sophia, now becomes the Greek phronesis, which means prudence. It's very interesting, that little shift that takes place there. Well, that's a very laudatory commendation. It comes from Solomon, and it says that these now are the gifts of wisdom, and of course, wisdom comes from God. Now, the Wisdom of Solomon is, of course, a Jewish book, a very Greek Jewish book, to be sure, not the kind of book that you would study if you're studying the Talmud, but a Jewish book, nonetheless, that became part of the Christian Bible through the Septuagint. But notice how different the Book of Wisdom presents the cardinal virtues than does Plato. In the Republic, the cardinal virtues are public virtues the ones that are necessary for establishing and maintaining life in the city. In the book of wisdom, they are a gift of the wisdom that comes from God, and they have to do with righteousness. If anyone loves righteousness, the fruits of our labor are temperance, prudence, justice, and courage. As I said, whereas Plato uses the word Sophia, wisdom, the Book of Solomon uses, or the Wisdom of Solomon uses prudence. So as I said, the first Christian to actually mention, in a very positive way, is Clement of Alexandria. But he too presents them not as coming from Plato. He says, some, some, winsomely, they come from Moses. That's again a little sort of literary conceit. But the interesting thing is he says, that they, as he puts it, he says, the rudiments of the whole field of morals are these. He's just quoted wisdom, courage, temperance, prudence, and justice. But what does he do next? He doesn't stop at four. He goes on, endurance, patience, reverence, self-restraint. And then he says, in addition, those of you who study Greek, epitutis, addition to these other things, piety or devotion to God. So the cardinal virtues come across having quite a different feel, quite a different resonance. So two points. When the cardinal virtues enter Christianity, they are presented as a gift of wisdom, which comes from God, and they lack something, and they need to be supplemented, which is the more in the title, the cardinal virtues and more. But at the same time, another Christian thinker, Gregory the Wonder Worker, also presents the four cardinal virtues. And like Clement, he too is not content with the four. They need to be supplemented, he says, by devotion to God, which he calls the mother of the virtues. He says, for piety is the beginning and end of all the virtues. Beginning with this one, we shall find all the other virtues grow upon us most steadily. So they're gradually being transformed so that they have a transcendent element, God, and they are expanded to include other virtues. So what I'm getting at in this probe into ancient texts, Christian thinking while working within patterns of thought and conceptions rooted in Greco-Roman culture transformed them so profoundly that in the end something new came into being while still respecting the old. So you have then really the Christianization of Hellenism rather than the Hellenization of Christianity. But I need to be more specific. I'm going to give you now three examples of how Christians in the course of the early centuries transform them, or at least supplement them. And the first is patience, which comes, as I said, in the passage from Clement. You never realize that the first treatise on a moral virtue ever written by a Christian was written by Tertullian around the year 200 on patience. Isn't that great? I mean, that's something we all need. Very much so, especially today. I mean, especially today. And he's a contemporary of Clement. He's living over in Carthage, writing in Latin in North Africa, and Clement's living over in Alexandria and writing in Greek. It's a very provocative choice. 
One would think that if a Christian were to single out a sing uh, one virtue, it might be humility, or compassion, or gentleness, or faithfulness, or the fruits of the Spirit that Paul mentioned. But no, Tertullian chose patience. And he wrote a treatise that never fails to charm and edify. And it's an inspired choice for us today. I mean, everything, everything in our world works against patience. Everything. All the phones you're carrying around and the messaging. And when you get a message, the person expects you to respond immediately. With emails. I mean, when you first start to use email, I'm talking about now as a mature person, I'm not talking about uh, young people. You know, somebody writes and asks you a serious question and you fire off a response without even giving it any thought. We do that all the time today. You know, you order a package on Amazon.com and it comes the next day. <laughs> and you're disappointed. I mean, the simple pleasure I'm sure that some of you young people have never had the simple pleasure of writing an actual letter and waiting a week and then getting an answer. And what a beautiful thing that is to write a letter and then a week, 10 days later, when you're not thinking about it, there comes this letter from a friend. So, but he didn't, he wasn't thinking about the 21st century. No. He, he was writing for more personal reasons. He said, I'm the most impatient man imaginable. So he was writing basically to instruct himself. He said, it's rash, even impudent, that I should dare to compose a treatise on patience, to speak about something for which I am utterly unfit. He says, usually a person writes about something that they can back up with personal experience or the authority of their own life, but I blush because I am not what I exhibit to others. So then, he gets in and he starts to give his reason. And what he's really saying is, is that patience is a divine virtue. And that's why we have to learn patience. And here's where he puts it. Got two, two reasons. One, God scatters his light over the just and the unjust. He offers the good offices of the season the gifts of nature to the worthy and unworthy. He bears the sins and wrongdoings of men. He restrains his wrath as men go about their lives, oblivious to God. By his patience, he seems to hide himself so that many do not believe he is the God who made the world. So patience then becomes a way of looking at the world in which we live and ourselves because we understand that without patience, God could not abide us. And so it, divine patience is an absolute necessity for human life. We live in a world, he says, that gives us all we need. And we can do with it as we wish. And God patiently bears with what we do with it. But then he goes on, and this is, for me, the most striking thing. The greater example of God's patience, he said, is that God allowed himself to be conceived in a mother's womb and await the time of birth. You ever thought of it that way? That's a sign of God's patience. He didn't come and have to do what he intended. And when born, he patiently awaits the delay of Christ growing up. And when an adult, he does not push himself on people, that is Christ, as God, but waits until they recognize him. And when he stands before his accusers during his passion, he patiently absorbs, endures their abuse, and says nothing. And the ancients, Porphyry, the great um, literary critic in antiquity, he made fun of Christ. Any kind of man would stand up. But he didn't say a thing. He just remained silent. Augustine saw something quite different. He said, the passion of our Lord is a lesson, a lesson in patience. Now, one might say that patience is another word for fortitude, one of the cardinal virtues. Cicero and Seneca had written admiringly of the virtue of endurance. But what they mean by patience or endurance, they don't use the word person, endurance, is perseverance in adversity. And that's quite different from patience. Because the singular mark of patience is not endurance or fortitude, but hope hope of the certainty 
that God will do his work in his own good time. So to be impatient is to live without hope. It's to live a life oriented to the present, whereas patience lives a life oriented toward a future that is God's doing. Its sign is longing, not so much to be released from the ills of the present, but to in, in anticipation of the good that is to come. And then Tertullian, he's a marvelous writer. He, he is, really. And he, he writes in these short kind of choppy things. Patience is loved in children. We all know that. Praised in youth. Admired in the elderly. It is beautiful in either sex at every age of life. <clears throat> Where God's spirit descends, patience is always at his side. So his book on patience is really a, a book of spiritual discernment. And it's interesting that the other two great North African writers, Cyprian and Augustine, they also wrote books on patience because uh, Tertullian had led the way. Now, more quickly, two more examples. How are we doing? Jesus uses the word justice. Those of you who've studied Greek, the word for justice is dikaiosyne. Uh, but it can also be translated righteousness. And so in the New Testament, when you see justice or righteousness, you tend to have to know the context to know exactly what it, the best translation should be. So let's take the Beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Many would translate that for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice or righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Or blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of justice or righteousness. Now, in the fourth century, one of the great figures, Gregory of Nyssa, the bishop in modern day Turkey and Asia Minor, he preached a series of sermon on, sermons on the Beatitudes. And he knew that the conventional meaning of justice was to give each according to its worth. That's what Plato means in the Republic. A, just, a judge is just if he judges people according to what each deserves, punishing those who are guilty and acquitting those who are innocent. But Gregory says, when I look in the scriptures, what he calls the sublime laws of God, I realize that there is a higher form of justice. For Jesus said that justice is something for which we hunger and thirst. Clearly, that's more than giving each person their due. One of the fascinating things about reading the church fathers is that they just have this delight in the language of the Bible. Over the years, I've just really gotten to appreciate just reading the Bible and just paying careful attention to the choice of words and images. And so he says, he just says we should hunger and thirst for justice. That doesn't really compute with giving to each one his due. Then he reminds his hearers that in 1 Corinthians, Christ is called justice. 1 Corinthians 1. God made Jesus Christ our wisdom, our justice, our righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. So if we read the Beatitude in light of 1 Corinthians, the Lord proposes himself justice as that for which the blessed long. So for Gregory then, the cardinal virtues then are not primarily moral maxims, but invitations to enjoy fellowship with God by possessing, hungering, and thirsting for Christ. So for the Christian, virtue can never be a matter of spiritual athleticism. Its goal is always seeking closer union with Christ and being formed in his image. So you can see how the virtues gradually get molded. And finally, Augustine. And Augustine is the most radical the interpreter. He ho says, I hold that virtue is nothing else than loving God perfectly. 
In other words, that the virtues for Augustine become forms of love, love of God. Temperance is love giving itself fully to that which is love. Fortitude is bearing all things for the sake of that which one loves. Justice is, serving, is love serving only that which one loves. And prudence is love wisely distinguishing between what hinders and what helps. In other words, temperance is love keeping itself entirely for God. Fortitude is love bearing everything for God. Justice is serving God alone and therefore ordering everything else to right. And prudence is love making a right distinction between what leads toward God and what hinders the movement toward God. Now that's a very radical reinterpretation of the cardinal virtues. So the church fathers were able to give order and form to their presentation of Christian ethics by approaching, appropriating the classical structure of the cardinal virtues. They domesticated them to Christian life, and in the process, they may have changed them so radically that they become something quite different. Yet by keeping the language and structure of the four, they handed on the classical inheritance to later generations and kept the cardinal virtues alive in Western culture. But one might ask whether Augustine went too far by turning the four virtues into forms of love. So in conclusion, I need to say a brief word about Thomas Aquinas because he thought he had gone too far. He was troubled that Augustine had collapsed the distinctiveness of the cardinal virtues by saying they were forms of love. And he realized that if the virtues were solely a matter of love, the moral virtues would then become theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. So he tried to put the best construction on Augustine's word. And he says, whatever Augustine meant, now whenever anybody says what someone meant, then rather what they said, it's likely there's some sleight of hand going on. <laughs> so he says that what Augustine meant was not that each virtue is love simply, but that it depends in some way on love. Thomas's reservations are well-founded, and in the discussion of virtue in the Summa, he makes up what is lacking in Augustine by carefully presenting the distinctive marks of each virtue. In other words, he's trying to recover them as moral virtues. Augustine lived at a time when the moral tradition of antiquity was still intact, and he sought to orient it toward the God of the Bible and the language of the Bible. Thomas lived at a time when it was in danger of being forgotten, the classical tradition, and he wished to preserve something valuable and true for later generations. But Thomas is always surprising. He knew that the cardinal virtues as the church fathers knew, could not contain the rich and fragrant wine of the gospel. So after discussing the cardinal virtues, he then brings in the fuller biblical tradition. He has an article then, after the ones on the virtues, on the gifts of Isaiah. Wisdom and understanding, counsel and might. Then he has an article on the Beatitudes. And then he has one on the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 6, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on. He just doesn't want to call them virtues. So you get both worlds in Thomas. With Thomas, one gets the cardinal virtues in their classical form, as well as the richness of the biblical language and imagery. One reason, I suppose, why one should read Thomas with the church fathers in hand and the church fathers with an eye on Thomas. Thank you very much.